All right, we'll just wait another minute here for Amy Rivera to join us. I just sent her a message also, Barbara. Great, thanks, Julie. Okay, it looks like she's here. Yep. Uh, great, so uh, at this time, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Julie, would you do roll call, please? Sure, Barbara Dayton. Here. Dave Conlon. Here. Tim Frazier. Here. Pat Braban. Here. Amy Rivera. Amy? She's muted. Okay, I do have her though on, on here. No. Amy's in attendance. Okay, all set? Yes. Uh, great, thank you very much, Julie. John, if you could uh, give us the flag. Thank you, if we could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the and to the republic of the king, the nation, and God, and the republic of the king, and the world. Okay. Um, thank you very much. And thank you, everybody who's here participating. We have a large turnout this evening because we have... Um, Thank you very much to all of our the, the committee members who participated in the meetings over the last few weeks and for joining us this evening. Um, you know, your guidance uh, has certainly been needed and appreciated and thank you for, um, for coming this evening. Uh, before we jump right into our opening plans, we do have a-, um, a Barbara? Yep. Can I, can I just ask um, everybody who's in attendance to this meeting other than the board, if they could just state their name so I have it for the record? John Knight. Katie Foreman. That's that yeah. shit. Crystal Reiner. Laura Fodine. Ryan Scala. Jacqueline Harrigurney. Amy Mitchell. Ben Jones. Christy Lamont. Tracy Crazy. Okay, great. I think I got everybody. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Julie. Uh, technically, I see we have public commentary one first for our items that are on the agenda, which is our uh, agreement with the Riverhead School District for transportation training and also the Board of Education calendar. Are there any questions from uh, the public about either of those items? No? Okay. Then um, do I have... A motion to move Board of Education uh, finance items A and B to a consent agenda. I make a motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you very much. And the main focus of this meeting then is the school's reopening plan, and we will be having commentary on that as well. Um, so, Deb, if you would care to um, start off with this. Yes, I am going to share the presentation with everyone now. Let me know if you're seeing it. Yes. Got it. You're good, everybody's got it? Because I can't you hit the present button. Okay, there it goes. Okay. So I'm gonna start by saying this is no easy decision. There's not one size fits all. 
We want to go back. There's nothing more that a teacher wants than to be with her kids. That's why they are teachers. Children learn best when they are in school. There's no substitution. However, depending on the trends of this virus, along with the directives and the guidance from New York State, the Department of Health, the CDC, schooling may have to function under one of three models, full in-person, hybrid, remote learning. We turned on a dime in March and our teachers, TAs did an amazing job as did our parents and students. We all know we need to improve our digital learning and make it better. Unfortunately, remote learning left some of our kids out of touch, left us out of touch with them. We didn't get to put our eyes on them. We need to open schools safely for our staff and for our students. Schools have traditionally been a safe place and when they weren't or we were concerned, we did things to make them safer. We did lockdown drills and we increased security when we had violence in our schools. So this is no different. Our parents do need an opportunity to voice their concerns and to um, give us some input. We put out a survey, not as many people responded as we were liked. We put out a survey to our teachers. Most of them did respond as well as our staff. We have to um, accommodate our most vulnerable and at-risk students, our, our special education children, our e students. We've created a plan with our stakeholders, which in the presentation I'll show you those individuals, to navigate a safe environment to at least minimize any impact of the virus on our district. We're gonna be following lengthy guidance that keeps changing from the Department of Education, from the Department of Health, and from the CDC. This document has to be a fluid document. It will change as the situations change around um, our nation as well as in our regional area. We don't wanna be lumped in with New York City. I wanna thank all the committee members. Many of them are present right now with us so that you can ask them questions directly. We had a transportation committee that I facilitated. Health, safety and facilities committee was um, facilitated by Mike Henry. The instructional committee was facilitated by Eric Casal and the guidance advisory council of social and emotional SEL was facilitated by Kerry. The documents you have here are all links. So for our community members, you can go to any one of these links to see the documents that we have been using. The last document on this page is a CDC parents guidance document almost like a checklist for parents who are really concerned about sending their children back to school. If you meet a certain criteria, this is what you should do. So I actually shared this document with one of our teachers who thought it was very helpful. So I put that on there for our parents. So let's talk about how we got started. Um, one of the important factors in this is communication, family, engagement. We engaged our stakeholders from the community. We communicated all related plans, uh, and we will, through our website, through videos, through text, through emails and social media. The district will train staff and students to follow the new COVID-19 protocols, including hand washing, proper face covering, social distancing, respiratory hygiene. We will um, do daily health questionnaires of staff, visitors, with students periodically. That's a recommendation from the CDC because of the 14 days look back. We will have signage. We're talking about our Chromebooks. When they open up, they will have a survey on how staff and students are feeling today, emotionally and socially. It will have some reminders on what they need to do for the day um, on that Chromebook. All communications will be in Spanish for those watching today it's in English and Spanish, the PowerPoint. So when we post this online, you'll have both there for you. One of the things that I did in putting together this PowerPoint presentation tonight was look at a 28 page assurance document that I must certify on Friday when I post this plan, reopening plan to our website. These assurances, I do not take lightly. 
every document the superintendent is charged with keeping the students and staff safe through this process. And I made sure that we did check all those boxes and they are in this plan in length if you read the entire plan. But tonight I've outlined it in the same fashion as the assurances to make it very easy for someone to take the assurances and check along the boxes for the, the, the plan that we put forth. I'm gonna take the first health and safety slide because I want you to know that the administration has been working very hard and reviewing a lot of data, not just the ones that I gave you links to, but in our school, we've reviewed square footage of every classroom. We are constantly looking at our enrollment by grade that changes every day. We reviewed current staffing by grade, special area with social distancing. That looks very different when you take a junior high class of 24 and divide it into 12 or 15 at most in order to have social distancing in a classroom. You're going to need more special areas, teachers, especially in the area of phys ed. We considered the ability of social distance. There's a slide in here that uh, of a classroom and what it would look like. We considered PPE supplies and face coverings. We've already started to order and yes, stockpile. We considered the availability of safe transportation. We surveyed our parents. The CDC, Department of Health, strongly encourage our parents to drive their students to and from school. The recommendation for the bus is face coverings at all times because they know social distancing is hard on a bus. We formed a transportation committee with our bus drivers and our uh, lead bus driver. We will follow all the Department of Health guidance regarding local hospital capacity. It's a requirement. So if Southampton Hospital goes over capacity, we may get a phone call from the Department of Health that we have to close because the hospitals at capacity. We considered additional space, trailers, tents, we're still considering getting our own tents because we feel that we could use them for activities such as field day when that returns, barbecue when that returns, but these tents could give us options for music or just mass break outdoors. Um, we can get some uh, reasonable price. The larger tents that could double for classrooms were just not only cost prohibitive, but then you have to think of toileting facilities that come with a host of other problems as far as social distancing goes. We looked at trailers. Trailers are can't even be rented right now. We did look at purchasing, or not even purchasing, just paying for one to be moved, but it's too big and we don't have a location to, to put it. So that was eliminated. We considered room utilization with social social distancing, what that looks like in our classrooms, depending on the class size. Our code of conduct has to be reviewed for all staff, visitors, and students adhering to the CDC guidelines. Mike, if you will take it from here on the health and safety. Yeah, I think the uh, schedule has jumped ahead of us a little bit, but yeah, we talked about the um, ill students and staff would be assessed by the nurse um, and quarantine if COVID-19 like symptoms and, or sent home. Uh, we're looking at putting a quarantine room next to the nurse's office for those situations. Uh, we're also looking at plans for the re-entry of staff and students and those re-entry plans have to follow the Department of Health guidance. Um, we've, we've got student and staff health questionnaires daily right now Every morning I drive in, I've got something comes up on my phone. I answer four or five questions uh, before I come into the district and, and enter the uh, business trailer. We're going to be limiting visitors to the buildings. Um, we're going to be limiting visitors to any of the remote buildings, the business trailer, the SYA building, and the, um, the portables, the steel buildings. We're working on signage right now for in the building, on the doors, at the Chromebooks, on the floors to maintain the six foot social distancing. Um, we've got some halls we're dedicating one way. So we're gonna have signage on there in order for people to 
know which way they have to go and where they have to be so we're not bumping into each other. Uh, again, Deb just mentioned the code of conduct to ensure compliance for all staff, visitors, students adhering to all um, guidelines. Uh, the next page is the obtaining and maintaining of PPE supplies for school staff, students who forgot their masks. We're trying to get a clear idea as to what we need to maintain in inventory. It's been suggested because hospitals follow it that we need a 90-day supply. A 90-day supply would mean we need somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 55,000 masks on hand. That's quite the investment up front in order to maintain an inventory level that high. But we're looking at that. We're going to see if uh, that's going to uh, apply to schools as well. Uh, we're not 100% sure, but that's where we're headed. We've got a bunch of protocols that we've, we're looking at, um, confirmed cases, uh, return to school compliance with DOEH and CDC guidance. We're looking at protocols to clean um, and disinfect the building also following the CDC guidance. We have protocols revised for revised fire drills and lockdowns to adhere to the social distancing. We're going to have uh, the de uh, daycare, uh, the district will, will transport the students to Project Most in lieu of on-site. Superintendent will be designated as the COVID-19 administrator. Um, a, a director of HR and PPS will be designated as the PPE procurement in, uh, to procure inventory. With facilities, we've already purchased hand sanitizers to install in every classroom, every office building. So you can go up and get your, the, the fluid to sanitize your hands at any time you need it. Uh, we've purchased some clear polycarbonate dividers uh, for students and teachers who work in small groups. We're also looking for other more portable dividers that a teacher, if a teacher has to come up to a desk, can put down in front of the desk and have that uh, divider between that teacher and the student. The construction crews, we had them from day one following COVID-19 protocols. They do their own testing and, and, and uh, questionnaires and things like that before they start on the job at the site. Um, we're exploring some dividers to go between sinks in the bathrooms to help maintain some, some space there. Uh, we're exploring the water filling stations for the SYA and the portables. Um, students are encouraged to bring labeled filling bottles for that purpose. Uh, we're going to be printing and laminating signs so we won't have paper signs up. They'll be a, a, a laminated so it makes it a little bit easier to clean and disinfect. The Univents. Um, pretty much every classroom's got a Univent in it, and the Univent's purpose is, you know, not only are they a heating source in the winter, but they enhance the air airflow through the, the room. They bring fresh air from outside. It gets filtered and, and, and circulated in the room, and then it gets exhausted back outside. So there's a con constant exchange of air. So we've got some protocols going with that. With There's filters in it, so we're going to step up the number of times we're going to be replacing filters within the unit vents periodically. Nurses' office, like I said before, and quarantine space in front classrooms, they're going to be installed with a new HVAC system that will accomplish the same thing as the unit vents. Only the difference there is it'll help cool the, the, the air a little bit. It's not really uh, an air conditioning system, but it will have the ability to cool it. But it will continue to have an, an exchange of outside air, pushing out inside air out, and just keep the flow of air going through it. We're looking at keeping classroom windows open in order to also enhance airflow through the classrooms. Like I said before, we're going to be doing cleaning, disinfecting frequently during the school day. The custodial staff is going to be receive training and assignment of sections for that purpose. After school, we're going to be doing a deeper clean and a full disinfecting, creating room by room cleaning checklists. Um, we're looking to maintain a perpetual inventory of all the PPE equipment so that at any given day, we know at the end of the day what we have in stock and what we need to reorder for, for the end of the day for, to get ready for the next few days. Um, training of students, faculty, and staff to include the proper hand and respiratory hygiene. 
I don't recall, Deb, did you mention about us bringing on a consultant for the for the um, health and safety consultant on to help us with a lot of these things? No, she I did not. Yes. Back out tomorrow. Um, so we're looking forward to getting her a little bit more active and involved in working with everybody. And that's it for facilities. Thank you, Mike. On the child nutrition side, we're still happy to report that East Hampton is providing uh, grab and go breakfast and lunch for our students and will continue to do that. Our bus driver will go and pick up that food so they'll deliver it to students on remote teaching or those that are in the school. Um, we will supplement that with blessings in a backpack program. The district has made application to Long Island CARES in addition because we don't have a cafeteria, we want to be sure that our students are fed not only during the week, but on weekends. Students will be trained to wash their hands. Uh, we purchase sanitizers, as Mike said, if there's no sinks in the rooms, there'll be a sanitizer in every single classroom where children will be required to wash their hands before they eat and after they eat. Students will be reminded not to share food. Um, we have videos that we want to make or actually there are so many online to remind students of all these things that they have to do and they're age appropriate for different um, age groups. Um, when students open their Chromebooks, those videos and picture reminders will be there. Students will have to bring their lunches from home. No outside food drop-offs will be permitted. Um, it's again to make sure that there are no visitors into our building. Bus transportation is one of the largest areas that the CDC and the Department of Health are making mandatory and not um, suggested. So every bus driver monitor will be trained on the proper social distancing, hand washing, wearing a mask, proper way to remove gloves. All um, cleaning will be done. We have a maintenance bus driver who does our maintenance for us. He will take on the deep cleaning and disinfectant at the end of the day, but in the interim, our bus drivers will have to um, sanitize all the frequent areas for, um, for our students. Our drivers and monitors will complete the health questionnaire before getting um, arriving at work since they arrive so early. You should know that these questionnaires go into a database. That database goes to our HR person who will be alerted if anyone answered the uh, a yes to any of the questions, as well as they've been advised if they have to answer yes to any of those questions, they are to call an immediate supervisor to tell them what their situation is. We are recommending people stay home if they do not feel well. Uh, they have to wear a mask on the bus unless due to medical reasons they're not able to. The windows on the buses as well as the hatches have to remain open. So that means in the winter months, students should be dressed appropriately on these buses for that to happen. We will be taking temperatures of each student at the bus stop. So this will make our bus stops a lot longer. So parents will have to be aware of that. Um, we will be showing students by video and in person how to line up for the bus. You have to load the bus from the back to the front. You have to dismiss the, the same way. The front students will get off first. So you have to load the bus very differently um, at the end of the day, and that's going to take us some time to do as well. As I said, the face coverings are mandatory for students on the bus as well as the driver monitors. We have also bought some shields for our monitors and of course gloves will be worn by both. And this summer we've been doing these routines already with the minimal bus drivers that we have and everything's been going very well. Students with disabilities who cannot wear a mask um, have been doing pretty well with the shields that we've bought for them. So again, that should not be a problem and students continually be trained on social distancing, even on a mini bus. If spring school is on remote learning for any reason, we still have to transport our students to non-public schools, and we have several in the area, Hayground, Ross School, and taking our special ed children to Southampton and to West Hampton Beach will still be our responsibility, whether we're on remote or not. And students who are sick will not be permitted to go home on the bus. One of the biggest concerns I have for the buses is our parents really need to step up and be at a bus stop in the morning because if that child's temperature is above 100, 
they cannot board the bus. Our current policy says we do not allow any student off a bus at the end of the day without a parent being there for any child under third grade. So I'm going to ask that they try to be at that bus stop because there is a possibility if that child has a temperature in the morning, that child will be returned home, of course, only if a parent is available to receive that child. Eric, do you want to take the social and emotional piece? I know Kerry had uh, a bereavement. Yeah, unfortunately, Mrs. Dalal, you cannot be with us uh, this evening. Um, she's dealing with a family issue, so uh, she's in our thoughts and prayers this evening. Um, before I go into social emotional, I just want to reiterate what Deb said earlier and what Mike said. Um, I want to thank everybody on all four committees that worked diligently, um, in some cases with me around the clock, it felt like. Um, but it really was, when you see the plan, when it gets posted to the website, you'll see that it's a really nice cross-section of the entire community. So I want to thank the community of Springs for coming together and helped us put this put this in. Uh, it wasn't an easy task, but um, I think we had really nice participation from everybody in the community. I'm going to talk a little bit about the social and emotional piece. Um, this is very, very important. Any of the guidance documents that you uh, have read, whether from the CDC, the Department of Health, or from um, New York State Education Department, social and emotional learning is a key point to this whole thing. Um, we've had a guidance plan, and it gets reviewed periodically. Uh, Ms. Delalio worked with the Guidance Advisory Council this past summer um, to update that plan and uh, make sure that it included all of the requirements that are COVID-19 related. Um, as students return, our mental health providers will continue to support students and families to address trauma. Um, we're pretty lucky at Springs. We have two school psychologists, um, a guidance counselor, as well as a social worker. All four do an amazing job. They really go above and beyond, um, really know the kids, really know the community, and we're going to count on them a lot to continue that amazing work. Um, our mental health providers will continue to receive trauma-based training. Um, we will continue to also implement our social and emotional curriculum, the Second Step program. We will monitor and refer high-risk students to our RTI MTSS committee for those students that need additional support. And we will continue to work with uh, community-based organizations uh, like Family Service League to continue to work the great to continue to with the great work that they have done with our families. Um, when Ms. Delalio started meeting with her committee, there were a number of questions that committee members have. Um, this is just a snapshot of some of those guiding questions that help them update their plan. The full chart with all the questions, basically a data analysis chart, um, is on page 30 and 31 of the reopening plan. So you'll notice that there's a number of guiding questions. For example, the first guiding question is, what social and emotional needs should we prepare for when our students and staff return? And in conversations and in looking at the guidance documents, uh, we know we're going to have kids and staff that are going to have fear, anxiety, confusion, anger, frustration, sadness, depression. Some of them, and hopefully most of them, will be very excited to come back to school. Um, secondary trauma um, and guilt, especially if, God forbid, um, somebody in their family was impacted by COVID-19. And, you know, to address those things, we're going to continue to make sure that we are compassionate. Uh, again, flexibility is the key to this whole thing. Um, we're going to have greater patience in classrooms. Um, we're going to make sure that we give kids time to get acclimated to the school, back to coming back to school, and also make sure that our staff has professional development that addresses the needs that they have. If you looked at our data from the staff, you uh, probably saw that distance learning and remote learning was uh, an area that staff felt strongly about receiving additional professional development. And we're currently working with Eastern Suffolk BOCES to hopefully provide that during our superintendent conference days. Um, when we return in September. And uh, right now, I'm gonna take a little pause. I'm gonna turn it back over to Deb, and then I will come back and talk about the instructional component. Ms. Winter? Thank you, Eric. So we considered a great deal before putting this plan together. We considered K-5 special education and ENL students in person, five days a week with grades six to eight remote learning. The recommendations from the Department of Health is early grades was stated, special ed was stated, and ENL was stated as the ones who suffered the most on remote learning. So when you talk about equity, it's not always equal. So we discussed that. Our problem at Springs is space. That shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. We are 
in the middle of a construction project because we needed space. Our building really is supposed to hold about 430 students. We are at 730. So we're already over capacity. So to try to make this work and, and be similar to our colleagues in neighborhood districts, we just don't have the space. K-5 is another option, special ed and ENL in person five days a week with six to eight cohort on a hybrid schedule. Um, concerns they are related to social distancing, space, and staffing to make all of that work. It would probably take us a good hour and a half to get everybody in on car line alone, and then the reverse going home. Just too many people in, in a space that requires social distancing to even enter and exit the building. Another option that we looked up at was the K to eight in cohorts on a hybrid schedule. Two days a week model would eventually maybe three days a week on alternate days, um, A, A, B, B day, A, B day. Um, concerns here is you have everyone on the same schedule, which is equitable, but uh, a concern about child supervision on the days that those children are working remotely from home. The high school is on a very similar program. So we thought if we stayed under the alphabetical listing like they did, that then there would be older children at home um, for our younger children. The other model we looked at possibly is we could get K2 in and social distance with special education and ENL in person, and then three to eight on a hybrid model. Concerns there related to meeting the social distancing requirements again, um, just getting people in and out of the building. Um, the time for teachers and students are in the same space is a concern. Um, the documents we received from the Department of Health said to try to mitigate that, get frequent breaks, go outside. Um, our children will be sitting in those rooms all day long. Yes, specials would come in, art, music, PE, but basically they wouldn't be roaming the building like they normally did for some of these activities being pulled out for small group work. Uh, it, it would be a very stark um, classroom for them and hard for a kindergarten through second grader to sit still all day long like that. So that was a concern for us. Having enough staff to provide all the special area um, schedules was also a concern for us. So up right now is the regular school schedule, just to remind everybody and I'll let Eric um, and the instructional committee who worked really hard. They. They really thought this out. Um, this is what they're proposing. Okay, thank you, Deb. So again, this is our regular schedule. This is a schedule that includes the 49 minute periods. Um, we put it up obviously as a point of reference. Deb, if you can go on to the next one. Yep. Um, what we decided after many, many meetings, and I'm glad that my committee members are here, um, was to really try to do something that phased us in. You know, if, if we look at what um, New York State did as far as creating different phases for reopening, we kind of worked along the same uh, avenue and said, you know, how do we get kids into the building by starting small and as we get better at this, as hopefully, um, you know, this becomes less and less of an issue, we can bring more kids in. The current schedule that you're looking at is bringing kids in, break, dividing kids into two cohorts. Cohort A, which would come to school on Monday and Tuesday, and cohort B, which would come to school on Thursday and Friday. We would work with East Hampton High School to make sure that our days match. So for example, if East Hampton High School had last names going from A to G or A to M on cohort A, um, we would do the same thing as much as we possibly could um, here to make sure that parents and students, if they had school, had school on the same day. Uh, Wednesday would be a day that kids would be on distance learning for everybody. What this schedule allows us to do, it allows us to bring in kids, about 350 approximately, at a time, and has two days of in-person instruction. So the teachers would report five days a week, um, and the staff that, we, that I worked with felt that this really maximized social distancing requirements. As I mentioned, it brings our teachers back full-time back to campus, and hopefully that will provide additional opportunity for additional collaboration to address some of the small issues that we encountered when we were on distance learning. Um, it also provides the availability that if this plan works, we could start phasing in that Wednesday as well too. Meaning 
on a certain uh, on, a, on a two weeks out of the month, cohort A would have school in person school three days a week, and then the following week, cohort B would have school three days a week. It allows us to gradually phase in um, our students coming back. Again, the model that we looked at was the New York State uh, reopening plan because, as you can, as you know, New York State um, seems to be a little bit ahead of the curve when it came to bringing uh, down numbers and uh, flattening the curve. Um, as I said, we will continue to work with. Uh, uh, Gary, could I ask you a question at this point? Sure. sure. Yeah. Did, did your committee consider instead of an AABB, uh, 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 just an ABAB, where the A group would be there twice a week and B group would be twice a week, but they would be consistently, um, the teacher would be able to see them instead of waiting such a long time between, say, uh, a, win, a Tuesday when they see the, the A group and then have to wait all the way to the next Monday before they see that group, considering all the calendar issues also? We did, Tim, actually. And the committee felt that for um, child care, this may be something better, something more feasible for parents to, to do. That was, that was discussed. Uh, I'm sure the committee would be open to looking at that. Um, you know, again, I think the important thing is trying to bring kids back in some fashion. And I think there could be some flexibility with, with the day. Um, you know, we could go back and discuss that. But, you know, that, that issue was discussed. And we as a committee felt that um, for, for child care issues, having parents know, okay, I need to have a, a babysitter available Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday might have been easier than doing it Tuesday and Thursday. We also looked at flip-flopping flip days and two days on, three days on, and, and you know, having an A day, B day type schedule. And we just felt it might be unmanageable for parents as far as getting child care. Some days it's Tuesdays and Thursdays, some weeks, and other weeks would be Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. What, what did the committee feel like was the best for students though and teachers? They felt this this one that we're proposing this evening. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, attendance, Deb, if you can go on to the next slide. Yes. Regardless of whether we are doing an in-person instruction two days or a hybrid model or distance learning, one of the things that will be different is that we will be taking attendance. We're going to be mandated to take attendance. Um, not only for our staff, but also for our students. Um, we'll have to work that out on when that's going to take place on the days that kids are on remote learning. Um, but in order for the 108 day um, rule to count, we need to make sure that kids are engaged 180 days. So attendance will be taken on a daily basis for us. Ms. Winter, I'm gonna turn it back over to you for technology and connectivity. Thank you, Ms. I am happy to report that our survey indicated 100% connectivity and devices for our students. The connectivity at times is not good, but nonetheless, every child had connectivity and every child had a device. We do plan to make sure every kindergarten and first grader has a Chromebook. Some were using parent devices, some were using iPads, and we can really um, monitor service if there is um, a problem with a Chromebook easy for one of our RT guys to help a parent through the process or to bring by the Chromebook and we can swap it out for another Chromebook. So in this area, I'm happy to report that we really had no difficulties moving to an electronic. We did get that donation that helped really so much um, with our budget having that donation of Chromebooks. But um, going forward, this is an important area that everybody needs to keep an eye on uh, is the technology availability for our students. Mr. Cassell, I'll turn it back to you. Yep, thank you, Deb. So teaching and learning, there were two guiding principles uh, that all the documents uh, refer to as part of the opening process. One, obviously, was making sure the safety and well-being of our students, staff, and ultimately families are our number one priority. And two, making sure that schools provide uh, substantive interaction between teachers and students, whether that instruction is delivered in person, remotely, or through a hybrid model with a focus on two perspectives. The two perspectives are equity, ensuring that students have opportunities um, to resources to reach individual potential, and personalized learning, um, really addressing and tailoring instruction to meet the needs, the strengths, and the interests uh, of our students. 
one of the things I think that, you know, the world is, is providing us is opportunity to have some of those deeper discussions, especially now with what's going on in the world. So those are um, there are two priorities when we, when we move forward. As I mentioned earlier, I do believe that the schedule that we have, having staff come in five days a week does provide additional opportunity to bring about additional consistency and collaboration among staff members so we can address some of the issues that we came across um, when we went completely to distance learning back in March, April, May, and June of this past year. Um, we will continue, obviously, to have two-way communications with our families and with our students and with our community. Um, we will continue to use our Global Connect system. I'm sure you get those texts from myself and from Deb, as well as the emails. Um, we will continue to post things on our website. We will also continue to use social media. Um, again, families that we came across that were in need of assistance um, felt, I think, pretty comfortable coming to their teachers and to our mental health support staff. Um, they reached out to either their teachers, their counselors, or to us directly. We will continue to utilize the March 2020 email um, in addition to our emails uh, for students and parents. Again, our mental health staff will continue to provide counseling services, uh, utilizing tele teletherapy platforms, and Google Meet for the days that the students are not in session. Um, we will continue to work with Family Service League. Uh, they have done an amazing job in working with our families. Um, and even uh, if we go back to full distance learning, our mental health staff will continue to work um, with our families in need and with our students that need that. Uh, as Deb mentioned earlier, she is the district point person for COVID. Um, with Carrie and myself being response leaders, uh, we also have a plan within a plan that if, God forbid, one of us gets sick, there are others on the administrative team that can step in and do the job of the other person if, God forbid, like I said, somebody does get sick. Deb, if you can go on to the next page, if there's no questions. Uh, Pre-kindergarten, um, we are going to continue to contract with Eleanor Whitmore. Um, we are currently waiting to get finalized paperwork from them, and I'm sure that will be for the board to review before that goes forward. Uh, but they have provided an invaluable service to us, and we will continue to work with them in the upcoming school year. Uh, special education, all of our students, as you know, if you've read the guidance document, will continue to receive a free and appropriate public education consistent with the health and safety regulations that have been displayed under all the guidance documents, whether in person, hybrid, or through distance learning. Um, Deb did mention earlier that students in the 12-1 and 8-1 programs will be in school five days a week, um, and that includes kindergarten through eighth grade students. Um, so those students will um, not be in distance learning. They will actually be in the building five days a week. Um, Students in the co-teaching programs will follow the same schedule as their cohorts. And again, we're going to ask students to wear a mask, um, even our special needs students, when they ride the bus. On the special ed um, uh, students, we do need to look at individual needs of our students. So some students may need a shorter day. Most of our students come in by minibus. So they, that may be an option with um, cooperation from our parents. But they do get a... a, a great number of related services. So we do have to be careful of that too. It will be a balancing act, but special ed students always had individual education plans. And going forward, we need to look at that as well and see how we can accommodate these students. Um, over the summer, they've been coming in for two hours. They seem to be managing, but again, that may be difficult to manage five days a week. Right now they're doing that three days a week in only two hours. So asking them to come in again five hours and stay in one room without a lot of uh, ability to move around may be difficult, but those decisions will be made on an individual basis um, as long as those students get what is um, on their IEPs. Eric, can do language, yes. Uh, we will continue to provide support for our ENL students to allow them access to academic content as well as providing them with supplemental language instruction. Um, the content will be, will be provided, as always, with adequate scaffolds and supports. Um, we are seeing a number, an increased number, as you know, due to the fact that the state tests were um, canceled back in the spring. Um, we are estimating with the incoming kindergarten students approximately between 125 and 140 brand new ENL students. Um, a language that will be new to us come the fall is uh, Russian. We do have a number of students 
um, that whose first language is Russian. That's new for us at Spring School, um, but we will be addressing uh, those children's needs as well. Um, our ENL students will have access, obviously, to the general education curriculum, and we will follow all the guidelines that have been set forth by SED. Um, we will we will um, assess the students when they come in. Um, as you know, there has been some uh, flexibility in the scheduling of those assessments. We will make sure that our ENL students assess those children. In addition, we'll also having our ENL uh, teachers contact parents by phone, especially those that cannot come into the building, so we can at least get to know our students, especially our new students. Um, each of our ENL teachers will have will have weekly office hours to accommodate a communication with parents um, and to ensure that their child's program is being met and meet all state and federal guidelines. These services will be provided through a push-in model, as Deb mentioned earlier, um, and Mike mentioned through also through uh, health and safety. Um, we're not going to be able to intermingle students. So when students come into the classroom in the morning, that will be where they will remain for the entire day, including uh, our middle school students. It will be our teachers that will rotate as opposed to our children. Deb, APPO? Yes. So the state has already um, looked at the AP, APPR plans and indicated with that we need to go forward with those plans. We will have to renegotiate with our STA if we end up on remote learning or our contact in those rooms have to be limited. So we're allowed to do that. We have to you know, agree to make changes to the plan, but it doesn't require a great deal to do that. It's just us all getting on the same page, but I think we'll wait and see what the year looks like. But if it looks like we're on remote learning for most of the year, we definitely will need to address our observation and evaluation um, system because it has to be done differently if we can't physically go into their classroom. So more to come on that, but it is on our radar, as is the certifications. So the commissioner's regulations did um, make a change. As you know, substitutes in, for our school could not substitute for more, to, more than 40 days if they weren't certified. It's now allowing them to go to 90 days for someone enrolled in a program who's looking to become a teacher, um, as well as certified teachers, used to be able to teach five classes a week out of their certification area. Now they will be allowed to teach 10. So someone like Mr. Knight, who I know is listening, um, is certified in elementary and science, but I know he's a real active guy. He could teach a phys ed class if we needed him to, and that would be allowed under this incidental teaching. Um, that the commissioner's regulations um, just came out with. So um, that that's helpful. I want to talk a little bit about the proposed change in calendar. This will need the Board of Ed to approve this at their next general Board of Ed meeting because it's a change to the calendar. This is similar in many districts. In fact, the New York State School Boards is hoping for the commissioner to come out with another uh, addendum that will allow us um, to be more flexible in our schedule. So I'm considering moving November 3rd, Superintendent's Conference Day to September 9th. They already spoke to the teachers union on that. If you remember, um, November 3rd is the election day. We were having Superintendent's Conference Day with uh, other school districts last year. It was really nice to do, but we really need the time up front. September 10th would therefore be the first day of school but only in the cohort A and students with disabilities. Again, bringing in um, some students at a time because there's a lot of new protocols to go over. Just busing alone, just car line alone um, will take us some time. Maybe we can get a fire drill or two in there with limited um, students in the building. Then September 11th, Friday would be the first day of school for cohort B. Students with disabilities would continue to come in. Cohort A would be required to do remote learning on that day. September 14th and 15th, Monday and Tuesday, school for cohort A, students with disabilities, cohort B would be on remote learning. September 16th is that Wednesday, remote learning for cohorts A and B. Um, September 17th and 18th, Thursday and Friday, school for cohort B and students with disabilities. So we're phasing this in, giving an opportunity for us to work with our staff and our students on protocols. September 8th would still be our first superintendent's conference day. 
And as I said, the, the board um, still needs um, to approve any addendum to the calendar. Um, Springs is also looking to work with East Hampton on how they cohort their students by the letter of the alphabet on what days students are going in. So we have similar families going to school on the same day or staying home on the same day. I know there are parents out there that have lots of un answered questions. I still have lots of unanswered questions. These are some of the questions that we have that we're still waiting for answers on. We're waiting for SED guidance on parents who elect not to send their child to school and want direct provided remote instruction versus homeschooling. And Pat, I have both definitions on this PowerPoint, the difference between both. I, I wanna go over those because there was confusion in that. Is the school district responsible for educating these students, not vulnerable and at risk students, students that parents just feel uncomfortable sending to school? Will the instruction requirements been similar to home instruction for a student who is out sick for an extended period of time? Right now that looks at five hours a week for elementary and 10 hours for secondary and students with disabilities. Or will that guidance be you know, those students need the district's remote teaching model, which would be similar to what we're doing now, where they get direct instruction two days a week and remote teaching three days a week. Have to see on that. How many parents will not want to send their children to school if given a choice? This plan gets posted by Friday. We'll make any corrections that the board would like us to, to make. Then the parents we will work with one of our community members who's very good at surveys to help us craft another survey where we find out who wants to send their children to school in September. I know it's early. I know we don't know what the virus is gonna look like in September, but we need to kind of know so that we can plan ahead. Once parents make a choice, will they or the school have to abide by it? If so, how long? So will the state give us the guidance that says decisions have to be made quarterly. Um, or can they change their mind after two weeks of doing, you know, remote teaching, they don't want to do this anymore, or their friends are in school and they want to see their friends. We, we have limited staff and we have limited space. So we kind of need to know so that we can plan appropriately going forward. And I understand it's going to be a very tough decision. What happens if we can't obtain PPE equipment? We're trying to stay on top of it. We're trying to um, hoard as much as we can. Wipes alone, if you try to go to the store and get wipes, I don't think I have seen um, sanitary wipes in Costco since March. Um, so they are hard for even us to come up with. BOCES is trying to help procure a great number of thermometers. We were able to get some of our thermometers through them as well as through, believe it or not, Amazon. Um, what happens if staffing cannot be maintained due to illness? You know, I will have to work with the Department of Health. They're the ones that are going to have to shut us down after hearing what our dilemma is. If I shut down, um, that will be a deduction off a of vacation day unless I get the Department of Health to, you know, see that, you know, we just can't open because it's not safe to open because we just don't have enough staff. These are all my unanswered questions and I'm sure others have more questions that we can add to the list. Um, there is an email attached to some of these documents. I've emailed that uh, address. I've spoken to BOCES and to the associations we would belong to. So we're still waiting for those um, questions to be answered. To answer your question, Pat, on home instruction, homeschooling by parents, these are the regulations. And actually the commissioner did extend the deadline for applications to August 1st. Springs has always accepted applications during the school year if a parent um, changed their mind mid-year or if a parent just moved in, they of course could continue to homeschool their child if they were homeschooling them in their other district. The parent sends a letter of intent to myself my email is there. The district sends back a letter acknowledging the intent along with um, their obligations to devise what they call an individualized home instruction plan. These are all in the commissioner's regulations. Now let's talk about home hospital instruction provided by the district. If a child gets sick and a doctor certifies to us that that child's gonna be out for an extended period of time, 
we reach out to our staff and we ask if somebody would like to tutor this child. Most of the time it's their, their actual teacher who says, oh, absolutely, I would love to continue to work with them. I think of um, Owen McCormick who, you know, actually did some FaceTime with a student that was in the hospital this past year so that, you know, the class could say hello to their, their peer in the, in the hospital. That instruction, though, is based on five hours a week of, for elementary students and 10 hours of instruction for a secondary student. So that's the difference between the two. Now, what the state comes out with as a guideline, will it be that we have to do remote learning for a parent who opts to keep their child home who's not sick? Or do we treat them all like this? We know if a child gets sick or is quarantined, even if they're not sick, this would hit, this would definitely kick in because the quarantine right now is for two weeks. So if somebody called and said, you know, I'm sick, my son or daughter has to stay home for two weeks, we would again immediately provide instruction for that, for that child. The last um, slide here is from the CDC. And it clearly says that you need to make a decision, schools. Can you do this safely? Can you provide the face coverings, the health hygiene, the disinfecting? If so, then yes, you can, you can move to move children into school. If you can't, do not open. And this is something we're going to have to keep in the back of our minds as this virus progresses and look at accommodating um, every child and every staff member as best as we can. We'll take um, questions. Julie, um, we'll start with the board and then go to, I'm sure you have many emails. Barbara, you could um, orchestrate that. I will unpresent here. Barbara? Yep. Thanks, Deb. Uh, I know Julie had said she'd gotten a bunch of emails. Do you, uh, any board members have any questions about anything at this point? Um, actually, I know I had a question early on. You talked about kids and temperature taking and getting on the bus. Or no, actually, if a, a child was sick at home and they would need to if there was a parent there at home to receive them. So if we have, if the nurse has someone who is not well at school and there is not someone, what happens with that child? The child is going to go into a quarantine room right next to the nurse's office. It's part of the new construction that would have been a small group room, but right. since it's not gonna be used for small group instruction, it will be used for a quarantine room. So that child would go there until the parent could come pick them up. But we really need our parents to cooperate with us. They need to know that they need to be on call. Okay. We have more than one space okay. if there was more than one kid who was sick in suspected of having COVID suspected would go into the quarantine room. Those students who have a bellyache and no fever would stay in the nurse's office. And they also, one of the regulations is there will be no eye screening, hearing screening, or scoliosis screening going forward. That was also um, a waiver that the commissioner gave us this year. Okay. Um, and then I also had a similar thought to Tim's as, as going over the plan with the AABB versus ABAB. Um, to me, it seems sort, sort of slightly odd having that day in the middle where you do have farther apart from kids and then the weekend in between. And, you know, is, is that really the, the optimal for the kids or is that what seems to work best for us for child care, care or educationally? Is that optimal or is it having having them like two separate days in the week optimal? Like like. And honestly, you know, which, which is it really without, you know, taking child care out of the scenario? Um, we felt that you, you're able to have the kids consistently. So if you begin some type of activity, Barbara, you can carry that through the next day. Um, you know, but I, I want to be specifically clear. None of this is optimal. Right. So, you know, this is what the committee felt that if we start a project, we start something on a Tuesday or on a Thursday, we can carry it over to the following day. Right. OK, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I would just like the committee to, to, to go back and look at that a little bit, just because I know as we go into the possibility of going to distance learning full time because maybe of a reoccurrence or whatever, it seems to me that would be a better, we put kids in a better place because they would be 
in a situation where the teacher could could actually monitor more of what they're doing in the classroom and also outside the classroom. So and it's, that's my thinking that, that, you know, and even if we have to shut down for a day or two, I think it might be more advantageous to have it every other day than having it two days on and then two days off. That's just my thinking. We will definitely bring it back to the committee tomorrow, Tim. Okay. And so actually, and so then and bearing that in mind, a question. So if we do actually have to shut down the whole school again, are you going to stick with these cohorts for remote learning or would everybody be um, receiving it at one time at that point? Our distance learning plan calls for everybody receiving it at the same time, Barbara. Right. Right. Eric, um, about the students staying in the classroom. This is Dave. Um, hey, Dave. Hey. Um, can you, what kind of like breaks maybe would the kids get? Like, could you expand a little bit about that? Just, just yeah. because it is asking a lot for the kids. The schedule that we're looking at is one of the things that this will allow us to do. And again, flexibility being the key is that we're looking to do PE every day for the kids. So the days that they're in school, they will get PE in addition to a secondary special. So it could be art, could be music, could be library, could be steam, depending on how the schedule rolls out. In addition to those times, we will also schedule, because we'll have to make sure that there's social distancing breaks for teachers, classroom teachers, to take their kids outside. So Erica Sal is a third grade teacher. Um, my cohort A, I have a break every Monday and Tuesday at two o'clock. I'm just using, as, using that as an arbitrary number. And I'll have the same break for cohort B on Thursday and Friday. So we're gonna try to get the kids outside as much as we possibly can. Um, we're also going to designate stations outdoor, outdoors in our fields. Um, so Erica Sal's class may go to station. I'm going to be at station four. Um, our PE teachers will be working with kids' classes on a one-to-one -one basis, hopefully allowing them to bring kids outside for, 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 for PE. Um, that is kind of the reason why we talked about a tent as well, too. Um, if the weather is maybe a little overcast or even sunny, really, really sunny for that matter, we could do some type of outdoor activity outside. So that's why we were thinking about the tent. Um, you know, the guidance documents are pretty clear. You got to give kids breathing breaks, especially the older ones, as well as our staff. Um, so you know, we're going to be scheduling breaks throughout the day. I, I think the idea of what school used to look like has to be suspended at least for the foreseeable future until we work out what this new schooling life is going to look like. Um, you know, and as we go through it, Dave, the first week or, or, or second week, and we don't see any cases, we will have to go to distance learning, we will tweak this. We're open to doing that. Um, the focus really of starting small was to do just that. Let's, and, you know, this is something that I know Tara Gurney and Deb Girardi spoke to us at great length about too, was it allows us to tweak issues as they come up. You know, this plan, um, although we have addressed all of the requirements that SED and CDC has asked us to, you know, until you actually execute any plan, you know, there's always going to be something that you run into that you have to tweak along the way. Having less kids in the building will allow us to do that more efficiently and safely. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, just thinking about the cohort thing again, since so many federal holidays fall on a Monday, if you're always having the same students in on a Monday, how would that get addressed? Yeah, we thought we talked about that too, Barbara. So I think that why it might be a good idea for us to go back and, and re-look re at re-examine that. Um, okay. Uh, do any other board members have a, a question at this point? I know Julie has mentioned that she has received um, a number of emails, so if she wants to share those. Um, and, and she did have a request from someone asking about the Spanish presentation, and yeah. I was quickly texting with Julie and Deb, and we can do this presentation in Spanish, um, you know, live like this another evening. Uh, going through the presentation, I'm happy to participate in that for uh, those parents who need that. And we can also translate it and put it on the website translated. Yeah. The PowerPoint is being translated. When we post it, the PowerPoint will be translated in Spanish. Eric, we need to find out about that Russian family, whether they need anything translated in Russian. All right, would you be aware of this on Thursday, Deb? So um, I haven't had a chance to speak to Elizabeth. Um, so I will as soon, and I'm sure Carrie's on top of it as well. Eric, uh, I'm still I'm, I'm misunderstanding about the Wednesday, you know, the one day, that, not the AA, the AA day or the yeah. BB day, the Wednesday, between the day between. How is that day going to be used? The teachers will be providing remote learning for their students. So it's on a day so they 
kids can catch up on work that they have missed. Um, they can do special area if that becomes um, too encumbersome for parents to do. It really becomes a day where, because teachers will be in the building. So it'll provide opportunity for teachers to touch base with kids, obviously take attendance, and have kids also catch up on any work that they may have to complete before they would return. And would the two cohorts work together on that day? Yes. Yes? Yes. And remember, Pat, the other thing that allows us to do too is that if, let's say, after a month, we say, hey, this is working pretty well, we can then bring that day back to in-school learning. So we can actually have three days for one cohort and two for another, and then flip-flop the following week. That brings us closer to the five days that we'd all like to be back. Right. See, and that, that's why I think the AB day schedule would be more advantageous than an AABB because of that possibility. Just, uh, just my thoughts. Yeah, and also, Tim, um, however, with the AB day, if the Wednesday is a, a Florida day, I'll call it a Florida day, you'll have the students learning on a Monday and learning on a Tuesday, two different cohorts. And on Wednesday, those two cohorts are working together. There might be questions of two different cohorts had questions about or problems they had that could work together as a classroom and see more of their friends and cohorts together. It's a good point, Pat. Yeah. Good point, Pat. So let me ask you guys a question while I have you here. So are we looking to see what East Hampton High School is doing to minimize interruption for parents? Is that I, I don't think we should. <laughs> you don't think we should? Okay. Well, I, don't, I, I, that's think, my I think it's important. I think it's important to, to understand what they're doing, but that shouldn't dictate what we do. It should, okay. Really I just want to make sure because we were thinking that if we were similar to them, Tim, so if a, if a parent had a child going to school Monday and Tuesday, then it would be the same thing for their high school student. They'd have the kids off. But, um, you know, this gives us more flexibility. Right. I think there's certainly a lot of high school kids who don't have younger siblings, and our focus really has to be on what's the most optimal of this situation for our kids, whichever that is. Um, and certainly this plan is, is a flexible plan and a fluid one, whereas, you know, what you're posting on Friday is not carved in stone. And as you think about it and mull this over, things like that can certainly get tweaked. And actually, Monique Sullivan just posted about the question about, you know, school being closed Monday. Could Wednesday be used as the makeup day if you were out on a Monday due to a holiday? That, you know. Uh, well, well, uh, as a parent who has one student in high school and one student in elementary school, through this whole thing, I found it was difficult for my older students, my older daughters, to work with my youngest son because they were doing their own school work at home. They got really involved in their stuff and they really couldn't attend him. So it's tough to you know, rely on a high school student to teach a younger student or be there with the young student while doing their own work. I mean, the high school gave them a pretty full schedule last year. And it was tough on them to do their own work and then help him with his work or even watch him. Well, yeah, we don't certainly want to facilitate things for our parents, but you don't want to then be placing an, an undue burden on our, on our high school kids if that's, if that's an issue. Uh, Julie, what, what sort of uh, questions do you have? Um, I have quite a bit of questions. Um, what I'll do is I'll read them and say, say who they're from. Okay. And if it's something that you've already addressed, just tell me to um, proceed to the next one, and I will. Okay. Um, I'm sorry if I pronounced somebody's name wrong, but it's um, Saibon Dolan had um, asked two questions. Assuming school is back in session in the school building this September, I would like to know the actual protocols that will be followed if either of these two scenarios happen. Scenario one, direct contact. A child or a teacher tests positive for COVID. What protocol will be followed for the students and staff that they have been in direct contact with? Well, and then, I'll, I'll take that one first, Julie. Okay. That, that's where the Department of Health does tracing. So the Department of Health would actually call that person and say, so-and-so came in contact with somebody who's been diagnosed with COVID and then tell that person what they need to do, whether they need to get tested, whether they need to quarantine, ask how many people are in the house. Um, so when documents show tracing, our job is just to be able to keep very good records as to who is in our building, who is on our buses, so that attendance is very important so that it helps the county do the tracing for um, COVID. Now, in regards to that, Deb, we know it can take a while for the health department to get back. 
and that you know we're not supposed to share stuff if the the health department hasn't said it and it, we you know so if we suspect someone has it but is it mandatory to say all right we're waiting for a couple days to, for the health department to get back to us or do you go ahead and tell that teacher or the kids in that class you know we suspect something happened or do you actually need something concrete from the department of health or a test result Tara, do you want to answer that? Is it similar to when we get a diagnosis of the flu or something that we send a letter? You know, Tara is with us. Yeah, Tara has to, you need to unmute. Yeah, sorry, it's not muting. There we go, sorry, unmuting issues. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if the doctor's office, I feel like any parent who tells us there's something we're going to need to confirm it whether it's with their doctor or call the Department of Health just to, to really be sure because we have a lot of parents that just say hey my kid has the flu and they've never been to a doctor so I think we're gonna have to rely on them um, and then contact the Department of Health and ask them what to do you know what they want us to do who to remove and we don't have to say who it was or we Anything can't like that. who it was. So, for example, Barbara, if it's a custodian right. who works exactly. nights, okay, that custodian, the only person that custodian would have impacted is the custodial crew. So they're going to know there's only, what, three of them. They're going to know the one that didn't show up for work is the one that's sick. So to the best of our ability, we have to keep confidentiality. So if we say it's it's a teacher from the third, fourth grade wing, you know, it's a process of elimination as to who's not in, but you may want to do that because they may have come in contact using the bathroom in that wing. So that's the, the type of careful designation that we have to make going forward. Okay. Okay, was there another part to that question? Yes, there's scenario two, indirect contact. A child or teacher has been in close contact with someone who has tested positive for COVID, but they themselves have not tested positive. What is the protocol for that person and any students or teachers that they have been in direct contact with? So they have to fill out that questionnaire and that questionnaire will be highlighted if any of the questions come back, yes. So that's why it's important to survey our students at least, at least, 10 to 14 days, because that's when that contact changes. So we, will, we will know if, again, if parents answer the questionnaire truthfully. Okay, my next question um, from Saiban Dolan is, has the school purchased air purifiers for the classrooms? No, we have not um, purchased air quality, uh, Purify us for the classroom. We are making sure that our filters are uh, changed in our um, unit vents frequently and leaving windows open in our classrooms. But air, air purifiers, no. It, it's something that we can look into. It hasn't been recommended. BBS um, has said to be very careful. There's a lot of vendors out there right now. Um, and anything we're going to purchase, especially anything of a, a number of qual quantities, to contact BBS. Okay, and the next one, Julie. I'm sorry, Julie. Can I just go back to that parent, just so that parent understands sure. what the uh, what it's going to be? So, what will happen? Like right now, Mr. Henry spoke about this early. We all receive a text in the morning. And there are a number of questions that we have to fill out. It's kind of like through a health app through Google, and the num the questions are, are pretty simple. It's have you or anyone in your family been in contact with a person that has tested positive for COVID-19? Have you or anyone in your family been in contact with a person that is in the process of being tested for COVID-19? Have you or anyone in your immediate family traveled outside the United States within the last two weeks or to one of the designated hotspots? Have you demonstrated any of the following symptoms? Are you having trouble breathing, have a dry cough, or have flu-like symptoms? That data will be collected um, from staff and from students periodically. That text will go out to parents on a daily basis that they will have to fill out prior to the students even coming to school. So you'll get a text reminder. It, it takes me literally 20 seconds in the morning to fill it out. 
and then the data go goes to will go to Kerry, and it will be um, um, kept confidential. I hope that answers that question a little bit more for that parent. Okay, and the second part of that question was, if we go to a A B cohort system, how are the middle school kids going to be grouped alphabetically, academically, or in some other way? Yes. <laughs> Well, as you know, we have a number of students that are slotted to be in inclusion classes. Those students will remain in inclusion classes. In eighth grade, you have two regions classes. Those students, um, unfortunately, will have to be grouped together. So if they take regions earth science, they will also have to take math, unless the parent does not want the children to, because remember, the children will be in the classroom all day. They will not intermingle. They will not change classes. Um, everybody else, we will, we will, we will, um, divide them uh, heterogeneously, as we do now. And siblings, we're going to try to ma make sure all siblings are in on the same days. Obviously. Yes, yeah, yeah. But then how does that work with these uh, these other uh, middle school classes, you know, the science and the math class, if we're, um, well, I guess those are broken in half, then also by last name? No? Yeah. OK. So if it has a class of, let's say, 20. <laughs> Right. You'll have 11 on one day and 11 on the other. Okay. Um, my next question is from Eric Metz. Um, he says, my three children go to spring school, and I was just wondering if distance learning is an option for this coming year, as I am still apprehensive about sending them to school. Thank you for your time. Well, that's one of the biggest questions we need answered if it's going to be something that the Department of Health recommends, because remember, they're saying in person as much as you can, and we're limited in space, so that's why we went to the hybrid model. Somebody, a district who has the space would have to be in person. But we're waiting for guidance. We'd like to accommodate parents who um, are concerned, but we need to see what that looks like um, before we can commit to that. What kind of time factor are they looking for us to give to those parents? And as we're talking about the class sizes going forward, they will be smaller than before. So like 15 to 12 students in a class as opposed to larger sizes. Correct. Uh, no. By breaking kids into cohort, Barbara, that allows us to really bring class sizes down. Um, if you go back to the presentation, I believe there's a picture uh, on, one of the on um, one of the middle school classrooms we set up. That classroom that we set up is 876 square feet. In order to maximize the space to put the safe amount of students in there with the six foot distancing um, and have it continue to be an in inclusion class where you have two teachers working in there, um, that class of 876 feet only safely fits 16 students. So if you look at the furniture, the way that's spread out and there'll be markings once our taping uh, gets in, where you'll see that those they'll be taping on the floor to give kids additional reminders of what six feet is because for, for kids, six feet could be tremendous or it could be not that big, depending on how tall you are. Um, but in order to maximize that space, you'll notice that we had to take things out like bookcases and shelving and things of that nature, where I know our teachers do an amazing job to really create really welcoming learning environments. Um, that's not going to be something that we can do right away. Um, as hopefully this pandemic gets to get, gets behind us, we will begin to gradually bring those things back. But right now, in order to maximize the social distancing requirements, um, we need to make sure that kids are the six feet apart. And so for, for a typical classroom, you won't see more than 18 um, people in there, including the adults, you know, 15 to 18. Thanks, Eric. Okay. Yeah, I, I have another question. I have. Um, Anne-Marie Diaz, but I believe you've answered number one, but I will read it again. How will you use our school space and how will staff members be used in order to keep our class size small? I do believe you've answered that already. If you have, I can move on to the next one. Yeah, that's by creating the cohorts. Right. Okay. Um, number two, if we are unable to share supplies, how, how we will provide age-appropriate quality education for our K-2 students who are expected to be in school all day, every day. These kids need books in hand, manipulatives, playtime, movement, small group instruction, STEAM exploration. Are we looking to increase the budget to provide individual supplies for students that meet, the, that meet these needs? 
It's unrealistic for young kids to sit for seven hours a day at tables, not leave the room and expect learning and social emotional wellness to thrive. Well, that, the town, that plan is not going to be in place anyway of K to two being there for five days. So we have the two, the cohorts of two days for those grades for starters. We're right. gonna start, Go ahead, Eric. We're going to start small. We're going to get kids individual manipulatives as much as we possibly can. Um, unfortunately, at this time, the board has already passed their budget. Um, so increasing the budget is not an option for us. I don't know if you had an opportunity today, Ms. Diaz, but the feds, um, are recommending that additional funding come into schools. Um, what that looks like, we don't know yet, um, but I'm sure, you know, knowing how we have operated in my 15 years there, that we will always put the students' best interest forward and we will try to accommodate students and teachers as best as we can. Um, until I know what that figure is, it's gonna be hard for me to say, we can order this and we can't order that, but we'll have to know what those, what that funding is actually gonna be, Emory. The, the cohorting, Eric, may also help um, because if the supplies sit for 24 hours, they may be okay the following day, not the next day. So that child may be able to go back to his bin the, the, the opposite day, but they can't share among the cohorts. So you more or less need two complete sets of everything for, for children. Correct. And that's what's going to make science very difficult. Um, the commissioner's regulations have indicated that science labs can be both remote and in person. It can be demonstration rather than hands-on for each student because they realize the cost is prohibitive for each student to be able to do their own lab and share supplies. But they do acknowledge that online lear learning labs will also count. Okay, the next one is from Charlene Thomas. She has um, several questions. I'm going to read them. Some of them, I believe, have been answered, but um, you can respond to what hasn't. Will teachers and staff have to do weekly COVID testing and definitely before any type of school reopening? Camp counselors have to do weekly testing. Will students have to be tested before starting school? I know that sleepaway camps require that and may be something to consider. Have they considered having a choice for parents to do online learning or sending their children in? that may cut down class sizes. Has it been considered to have the students loop with their classes and teachers, especially my fourth grader, as he has already been in a good flow with online learning with his teacher rather than having new teachers this year and kids adjusting to that teacher, they will already be in a flow for online schooling. Eric, I'll take the first one with weekly testing. At this time, you need to show signs of COVID to be tested. They haven't said that teachers, even bus drivers um, have to be tested or can get tested, you know, just for precaution's sake. Um, the choice for parents we addressed. Eric, do you want to talk about the fact that the kids are looping versus the, ch the teachers? Are you muted? I apologize. I just don't want to get feedback. I apologize. Um, yeah, one of the things that we discussed back in May with our staff was looping the students, not so much the teachers, so the kids would be together. Um, we're going to try to do that to the best of our ability. So, for example, if teacher A had 20 students this year, to the best of our ability, we're going to try to loop those 20 students to the next year's teacher. That will allow that teacher only to have conversation, that, that incoming teacher to have conversation with only one teacher. And because we'll have that Wednesday, we're looking at to do some professional development with some cross grade planning um, that will allow the teachers to work together, not just within the same grade, but also from one grade to another. So um, we're hoping to address some of those concerns in that manner. Okay, Julie, was there another one there? Um... Yes, I do have more. I'm just going through them i just want to make sure i get everybody um how old are those un events and how do you mean by most classrooms have them owen mccormick mike do you want to take that i 
I, I can tell you the rooms that don't have unit vents and they are not um, going to be used with this model because you can't pull children out into the steam room or pull children out to the math room. So those two rooms, the board already has asked me to look into um, putting some sort of unit vents in them, but all the other classrooms, full size classrooms have unit vents. It's just the math lab room and the steam room that do not have unit vents in them. Even the psychologist office has a unit vent system in it. It looks different than the classroom unit vents, but it is a unit vent. Yeah, they're usually on the exterior walls under the windows, in case you're not sure which they are, but almost every classroom has them. Um, didn't EnviroScience think it was a good thing that we had those vents, or one of the other firms who were? Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. Barb. It, was, it was in bioscience. Um, believe it or not, central air conditioning is not recommended because you're taking the air and circulating it through multiple classrooms. These unit vents are specific to that classroom. So that's what makes that really um, ideal. So it's, it, it's the one time I'm glad we don't have a cafeteria. <laughs> Our children are used to eating in their classrooms. We have staffing to monitor children eating in their in their classrooms. Um, and I'm glad we don't have central air conditioning. Okay, Julie, uh, next. Okay, I have um, Elaine Bickley. Um, she said, thanks to the administration committees for putting together the reopening plans. It's a huge undertaking. And since there are so many unknowns, it will bring more questions as we move forward. Here are some general questions. What PPEs will be supplied? What cleaning supplies will be provided? What types of cleaning, if any, will be the responsibility of the classroom teacher? Will temperatures be taken and when? When will the deep cleaning take place since staff will be in the building on Wednesdays? Okay, the PPEs are your mask, gloves, Shields, you know, um, the ones that come over your face to protect your eyes. What am I missing, Mike? Um, nurses will have gowns if they, yeah, they gowns. Need them, as well as um, N95 masks. So the cloth masks are what's recommended for our classrooms and for our students. Cleaning supplies. We have to keep a list of all of our cleaning supplies. We are working with EnviroScience and our consultant to buy the appropriate cleaning supplies that are 99% um, kills you know, COVID, as well as um, disinfectants. So the disinfectant is a spray and you spray that on and you leave it for 15, 20 minutes before you wipe it down. We're asking that our staff take their temperature before they come in. It's part of that questionnaire. So we will not be taking temperature of our staff as they come in, but we will be taking temperature of our students before they get on the bus and before they get out of their car on car line. Um, we plan to do deep cleaning every night um, and then disinfect every night. So we do not see a need for quote, deep cleaning on Wednesdays. We will need to shut down classrooms if there is a COVID case in a classroom, and even our custodians will not be able to go in and clean those rooms for 24 hours. I think the other part of her question was, uh, what teachers will, will, we, will be doing? Oh, um, one of the things that we will do is work with teachers and students, training them to keep their areas clean using disinfecting wipes that are EPA approved. Um, they will have to, they'll be responsible for wiping down their Chromebooks. We will also be setting up a schedule for our custodians to do um, maintenance cleaning every hour on the hour, cleaning bathrooms, wiping down handles in classrooms, um, light switches, you know, commonly touched uh, areas, those type of things. And what I recommend, um, Julie, is we take all these questions and w the cabinet will do a Q&A that we can post on our website. Okay, no problem. Um, the next one's from Jennifer Brussel. She said, good afternoon. Below are some questions that we have regarding the reopening of school in September. 
which we would like to be shared during tonight's public board meeting at 7. We understand that you may not have all of the answers yet, and we thank you for all of the efforts you are making in order to guarantee a safe and smooth transition to whatever September may look like. We've heard that there will be two pods. One will be attending school Monday, Tuesday, and then the school is disinfected Wednesday. The second pod will be in school Thursday and Friday. If this is the case, how will you decide which children will be in school on what days? Will it be half the alphabet on Mondays and Tuesdays and the other half Thursdays, Fridays? If so, what will the cutoff letters be? Will any staff besides custodial staff be in the buildings on Wednesdays? If so, how can we be sure the school is properly disinfected? Will students be in school for a full day? We are hearing that students are not going to be able to leave their classrooms for specials, lunches, etc. As a teacher myself, I find it hard for students to attend to instruction where there are two or three classes or subjects being taught back to back without a special. What will be implemented so that we can be sure students and teachers, of course, are getting developmentally appropriate breaks. I'm also thinking of the weather and how September and October are known to be hot back to back school months. A seven hour day will be a long day in a hot classroom and no movement. If students are attending for a shortened day, what will that look like regarding dismissal times? Will recess be allowed outside weather permitted by class? What protocols are in place, if any, for students and staff who are immunocompli compromised or have underlying conditions? If a student tests positive with COVID, will that whole pod have to quarantine for two weeks? Uh, what about the whole class? If so, what about the teachers that were in contact with that said child? If the child is a, has a sibling in Springs, will that sibling's class have to be quarantined? Will the district be implementing any specific safety measures to take note of those who live with whom for further safety precautions? What are the protocols going to be if a student or staff member gets a fever or feels sick? Will there be any form of professional development or training for teachers on teaching during such a difficult unique time. I'm thinking about student social emotional well-being and how we can be sure students feel safe in their learning environment. How are we going to make sure our teachers feel safe and safety measures are appropriate? Will administration be checking in with teachers on a daily or weekly basis about what is and what is not working in the classroom? Effective communications will be crucial and a key component in making this all work. Will teachers be required to take temperatures on a daily basis or will it be early in the morning carline staff? For classrooms that do not have bathroom in their do not have a bathroom in their room, how can we be sure there aren't too many students in the bathroom at once? If classrooms do not have sinks in their rooms, will there be proper hand washing taking place? Lastly, what kind of security measures will you take to make sure the adults with masks on are the adults that are permitted to be in the building? Our good friends sometimes do not recognize us in public due to our face faces being covered by masks. I'm thinking about the construction going on and whether or not construction workers will be permitted to work alongside our students as well as the possibility of someone entering the building with a mask on that one may just assume as a worker but in reality is someone that should not be in the building. Thank you for taking the time to review all of our concerns. We thoroughly appreciate your diligence and support during these unprecedented times. Sincerely, Jen and Josh Brussel. I think I'm going to speak to the security one because we are going to insist that every staff member swipe their card. There will be no holding the door open for anybody else. Our system allows us to trace who's been in our building and what time. So take our IT people, they go in and out of our buildings. They don't remember sometimes that they were up at the SYA. So we've been looking at something that we can put on the SYA and the portable that can be moved to our new building. So we're not you know, wasting money because those buildings are not gonna be used a year from now, but that it actually can be integrated with our system the following year on our new site. So that'll be something we will stress to all our staff. You need your ID card visible around your neck and you need to swipe it in going to any building on the campus because we need to know who entered the building. Just like now, we sign in when we go to the business trailer because two weeks from now, I may not remember I went to get my mail 
and somebody in the business trailer got sick. They'd want to know that I was physically in that building. So we have a sign-in book right now because we don't have a, a card swipe on that building. But I met uh, personally with um, the IT department and with Steve Mazza, and they're putting together a proposal for that. Um, professional development, Eric, um, I don't know if you want to talk to Second Step, is coming out with a teacher-generated Second Step to support our teachers? Yes, that is COVID-related, so that will be professional development that will be provided um, to our staff. You know, the good thing about working with these committees, and I mentioned this earlier, so I apologize if I'm repeating myself, is that we've had trem tremendous amount of teacher input across the committees. Um, you know, the teachers, I think, not only met with us numerous times, but brought the information back to their colleagues. So I think a lot of the issues were addressed um, earlier uh, as far as working with our staff. As far as the breakdown for children, um, we're going to look at where we're going to have that demarcation line as far as uh, last names. I can't give you that answer off the top of my head until I sit down with each child, student by student, to see how that would look. But um, you know, we are going to do it as best as we possibly can to ensure that we're maximizing social distancing. Um, Mrs. Brussel, we agree with you. This is not ideal by any any uh, form of the, form of, of the word. But um, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to try to schedule breaks as much as we can. We're going to give kids PE the days that they're in the building, in addition to a, um, other um, special area classes. So students will have those two breaks plus their lunchtime plus other scheduled breaks. As far as bathrooms, we do have hall monitors. Um, those hall monitors will be trained on how to bring kids to and from the bathroom. They'll have to check the bathroom before allowing anybody to go into the bathroom, making sure that there aren't a, a group of students already in there. And then following social distancing guidelines, they will let students into the bathroom. Um, we are going to be designated, Mike Henry said this earlier, hallways as best as we can as one-way traffic, especially in the elementary school. In the middle school, that's going to be a little bit harder because there's only one hallway going to and from fifth grade uh, to eighth grade once the construction project is completed that becomes easier. Um, I think I answered all of her questions um, to some degree. I hope I did. Um, again, if there's something that you feel we did not answer, please feel free to email us and we'll be happy to answer those questions uh, You know, first thing tomorrow morning if we missed anything. There was quite a few there. There's quite a few and some we hadn't touched on before, but quite a lot that we did. So um, I'm thinking maybe a response to, to people with um, who maybe had more specific questions that we didn't get to and then probably posting those things online okay. so yep. everybody's aware of what the questions were and how they were answered and not sort of duplicating same issues probably. Correct. Um, Julie, I, you, I know you said that you have a lot more emails, so how many are you looking at? Um, I have about seven. Oh, okay. Yeah, seven or eight. Um, Simon Dolan, these are the ones that have come in since we've started uh, speaking. Who is going to assist Group A on Thursdays and Fridays if they need help with their assignments? Will they have to wait until in person the following Monday as their teachers will be busy with Group B on Thursday and Friday? Question. Students will have, uh, excuse me, teachers will have office hours on the days that they are teaching live students. So one of those periods, teachers will have office hours to work with small group, groups. So let's say I am teaching on with to my A cohort fifth period every day may be the day that I have designated to work with students. So that during that period, she can touch in, uh, they can touch base with their teacher to provide that additional support. So so you're with the B cohort students on that fifth period, say, for example, every support, day, correct. there will be a time period when students can actually check in. Yes. OK. Uh, next, Julie. OK, the next one's from Patty Hicks. What will the classrooms look like for the K-2 students? Will there be books, math manipulatives, learning materials, and games, or will it be an empty classroom with desks and tables? If it will be an empty classroom, what will instruction and learning look like for these young children? OK, Eric, Deb, who wants to? Um, you want to put the picture back up there? Um, you know, one of the things that we asked our instructional committee was to reach out to their colleagues um, to see what type of digital programs, digital resources, online resources, software, um, technological equipment that they're going to need. So we have a pretty comprehensive list of educational resources that is on the plan. And when the plan gets posted, you can see all of those. 
I'm just going to give you the correct uh, starting on page 25 and running into page 27 of the actual plan. So once the plan gets posted, you will see those resources. As I mentioned earlier, um, we have to minimize the sharing of materials. We have to minimize things like books at this current moment as far as passing things along. As we receive additional guidance from SED and from the CDC and from the Department of Health, we will slowly implement things in phases, just like New York State did. Um, but I think to, to answer your question about how it will look like in the beginning of the year, it will probably be somewhat stark, um, somewhat sterile. But as we receive additional guidance, we will make those accommodations. Uh, I also wanted, Jen Brussel had a question about contractors. Contractors will not be intermingling with our staff or with our students. The work that they will be doing will be um, out in the out part of the building. Um, and work that they have to do in the building will take place later on in the evening when nobody else is in the building. Uh, speaking, going back to one of uh, Jennifer's questions about recognizing who people are, this is something I was thinking about, especially for younger kids and new classmates, and you're not looking at that face. So are we going to be suggesting that people wear name tags or something in school so people can really tell who others are, especially amongst the kids? You want to take that, Deb? You want me to take it? I, I think it's an excellent idea. I mean, our teachers usually do something with names, whether it's um, games or on their tabletop. Remember, they're going to be given a space that, that's theirs for whether it's the two days back to back or every other day. So that's um, the other thing we're going to be purchasing is lanyards. So maybe we can personalize the lanyards with their names. The lanyards actually hold masks. So what we didn't want was when a child takes a mask break, their mask is blown around the room, but will be attached to a lanyard that um, disconnects from the top so that it's safe, okay? But then their, their mask can hang there when they go outside or when they eat lunch. But that can also be personalized with their name on it. I think that's a great suggestion, putting, having kids wear name tags, teachers, the first couple of weeks of school. Um, okay, my next question is from Melissa Knight. What is being done for classrooms without sinks to ensure frequent hand washing? Will portable hand washing stations be put in or sinks? We're going to be using sanitizers. We've ordered um, the sanitizer dispenser for every single classroom, offices, and areas that, you know, do not have sinks in them. Okay, my next one is from Kimberly Sherline. She says, hi, what happens with children who have siblings with different last names? For example, mine, I have an H and an S. Eric, we would try to accommodate that, correct? We will accommodate. Before we place a kid, we will look at our student management system to see what siblings they have in the classroom, in the school rather, and we will accommodate those siblings. If of course, for whatever reason, something gets misscheduled, we encourage our parents to contact us immediately and we will rectify the situation. Okay, the next one is from Casey Daleen. We have a rising kindergarten and second grader. If the kids are in the same classroom all day, what is the classroom environment like? How will it change from the way it used to be? Masks all day, scheduled supervised hand washing, social distancing, etc. I assume. So I think this, these questions were answered, but I'm going to field everything that's here. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Yep. And the next one is from Charlene Thomas. Will there be running? Will Will they be running the AC units in the school? Again, no AC units. Oh, actually, I mean the the individual ones in the rooms. Got. It. Yeah, we have individual ones in the room. Right. Those okay. will run. Yes. Those will be used. No, the windows will be open. Windows, right. right. Yes. Okay, right. wait, next. Go ahead. We're even looking at where we can leave windows open, you know, um, for a longer period of time, you know, because remember, we have custodians in our building till 11 o'clock, so they can go around and close windows before they leave at 11. So extending the time that those windows are open. Okay, the next one is from Walter Ginhorn. Um, he has three quick questions. When will we know our cohorts? Is there a scenario where possibly many parents will elect 
to have distance learning full time and other kids can go back more than two days a week since those choosing to be in person may be in a small quantity. Third, when approximately will we know about pre-K? Thank you. Um, Pre-K, they should have been called for AM or PM. There are only about three people on a waiting list for pre-K. So I'll follow up with that person tomorrow, Julie, um, on the pre-K level. As soon as we get this survey out and we know what parents have made the decision to come back or not make come back, I think that's when Eric will know whether he needs six sections of kindergarten, five sections of kindergarten, and determine his cohorts. So um, if I had to guess, we need at least a couple of weeks. So it might be mid-August. Correct, yeah, I, yeah I, I would agree with you, Deb. I, I, I think, you know, the more parents that respond to the next survey that we put out, the better information we're going to have. So we really urge our parents, any of the surveys or any of the information that we're asking you to fill out really just helps us plan um, for a smoother opening. So we urge and encourage all of our parents and staff that if we send that information via survey to please fill it out. I know it becomes, you know, uh, cumbersome after a while, but it's important for us so we have as much information as we have as we can collect in order to make you know informed decisions okay my next one's from owen mccormick he said thank you but how old are the univents i don't have the answer to that on the top of my head um i would have to look at the last five-year plan it would be in there and then the new five-year plan is is going to be done probably within the next week or so uh, Deb, if I'm, if I'm, I think I'm correct in, in thinking that the, the key is the filter change in those unit vents. Yeah, right. right now they're supposed to be changed once every three months. We're going to right. accelerate that a bit. But as far as the age of the unit vents, it depends on what year the addition was built. Yeah, I, I would be more concerned about changing those filters on a regular basis and necessarily how old the unit vent was. Yeah, and we're looking into the plan on exactly what type of filters would be better to use and we're looking at either once a month or once every six weeks. Hey Mike. Yeah. Is, uh, is, now that they're going to require us to run the unit vents and have the windows open, are they contradicting each other? We talk well, to you if, if we have the windows open, we're going to turn the unit vent off for that period of time. There's no That's sense. You're right. Right. So You're right. We should probably get a plan through a viral science on probably how to do this. So we're having the windows open, the unit vents are not running, and it's a mood point. Right. So, well, I guess we'll put up another procedure for that. Okay. Bye, Mr. Okay. Meeting. This one is from Ashley Delapola. She said, how are students moving from point A to point B? Following six-foot social distancing guidance, mathematically, this would require a 60-foot long line. And how does recess look like? What is a plan B for recess when outside is not an option due to weather? Well, I think that's what the cohorting would do, right? So if you have a class of, let's say 20, you'll have 10 students. If you have a boys line and a girls line or even one single line, hopefully that will be smaller. Um, we were going, we're going to dismiss by class. We're even gonna call buses by routes. So our dismissal procedures and entering procedures will be a little bit different. Ashley, if you take a look at that schedule that's on um, that we spoke about, you will notice that there will be a homeroom period for everybody, including elementary uh, students. Um, that will provide teachers an opportunity to do some social and emotional, have kids catch up maybe on some independent work, while also allowing us to make sure that we can bring in the kids safely, especially um, that we're going to be taking temperatures of everybody. You know, the cohorting also allows us to do that over less amount of students as opposed to having to do that for 700 students. So we're hoping also part of the cohorting is that our arrival and dismissal procedures um, do not become extended. Again, we will have to tweak any schedule. And that's why we said flexibility is going to be key here. Flexibility on the part of our, our staff, flexibility on the part of our parents to address the needs as they come up. The, you know, you'll see that when we post the plan, it's about 120 pages long. It's pretty extensive, um, but we may have to tweak things. That's why I said it needs to be fluid um, because oh, after a week, we may realize that this is not working and we may have to uh, readdress a specific issue and we will do that. 
Yeah, I think also, Eric, that again, just having patience in this process, you know, the kids, this is new for kids. And so it's going to take some time for them to uh, really uh, get all the things down they need to understand. And we have to have patience with them to do that. And they and parents have to have patience with us in order to make this work. But I think in looking at the plan and listening to conversations, you know, we're trying to think through every scenario and make sure that uh, kids are safe first. But it's going to take some time to get all these things in place, I'm sure. Tim, you bring up a great point, the safety and well-being of our students, staff, and ultimately our families, because, you know, the kids will be going home is our number one priority. So that's why, again, I think starting small is the way to go. And as um, we get better at it, hopefully the pandemic um, starts to dissipate, we will be able to bring life to some type of normalcy. But I think for the foreseeable future, it's going to look and feel different for our students, for our staff, and for our families. Uh, thanks. Julie, are there any more? Yes, I do have some more. Um, Rebecca Moss, my two cents. Heard many parents preferring alternate days. That's very tough for parents to manage with work and also think it's more consistent for the kids to each have two days straight. So I like what the board initially proposed this evening. Also, how will instruction work on the remote days? Um, we will definitely bring this back to the committee. Like I said, that may be a question that we ask as part of our next survey, which model families uh, prefer. So at least we're getting additional input from our stakeholders. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the distance learning will be more independent work with teachers providing office hours for kids to check in. So they will begin um, their lessons in person, whether they're on the A cohort or B cohort. Um, Wednesday, they'll be touching in with touching base with all the kids. And then the days that their kids are on distance learning, teachers A, are taking attendance, checking in with kids, but also going to be working in, I, we foresee it being more in smaller group, addressing specific needs of students to get the um, activities and work completed. Okay, and Tony L asked, will the students be permitted to have recess outside weather permitting? If not, why? That again, I'm sorry, Julie, you cut off on my end. I apologize. Um, Tony L asked, will the students be permitted to have recess outside weather permitting? If not, why? Well, A, we can't intermingle students. Um, so the recess periods that we had before where you had six, seven classes going out at one time is not going to be permitted. Um, we will schedule recesses, as I mentioned earlier. We will schedule recesses by class each day for the kids. Um, really, it's an opportunity for kids to go outside, stretch, get a breathing break. Uh, PE will happen every day for the kids. Um, but they are not going to be able to go outside the way they are now because if we intermingle those kids, um, we're going to have issues. And those at the moment, we have limited room. space outside. Correct. We, we've yeah. lost that backfield and the playground, so we're just working with a much smaller area. However, that can be made to work. So our teachers are going to have to work with us when we come up with schedules, um, you know, when, when we implement those schedules, because we can't just have every class go out there at one o'clock on a beautiful day. We'll have to be scheduled. Okay, Summer Borsak, thank you for taking the time to address our questions during the live stream. Will we be able to 100% distance learn even if students are attending school in person? I need to know this in order to make an informed decision prior to the 8-1 notice of intent to homeschool deadline. Yeah, I, I don't know what that home instruction would look like. So if a child is compromised or is at risk, absolutely will get what's called home hospital instruction. At this point, I do not know whether we can um, do both remote learning and full-time remote learning and in-person hybrid model. We have to see what the numbers are on the staffing is and see what the regulations require us to do. I'd like to be able to be all things to all children. I just don't know if we have the resources at Spring School to do that, but we definitely will get back to our parents as soon as we know the answer to those questions. And the surveys, as Mr. Casal said, will be very important to indicate your preference. If we have 31st graders 
who do not want to come to school, then there's a teacher there. If it's two, then we have to make some tough decisions. Okay, Julie. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like you're receiving more questions as we're going along here. Is that correct? Uh, you there? Oh, she's muted. Um, Julie's muted, but she did just send me a question saying that someone sent saying, when is the next in-person board meeting? And if we can't have meetings in person, does it make sense to have learning in person? At the moment, we can't go where it's our having these building issues right now is, is, you know, is not helping anything at all. Um, you know, before we've had meetings in the library and elsewhere, there's been a lot of work going on there. So I don't actually know when we can have, we have to get uh, clearance that everything's done before we can go back in the building. Barbara, right now you have yeah. a regulation from the commissioner, um, from the governor, really executive order from the governor that um, is indicating your remote meetings until August 6th. So when you want to come back in August, we would have to look for an alternate um, spot for our board meetings. Um, we could use the SYA building until we can clean out the library. Right. I think to, to maybe also answer that question is that, you know, that's what this whole process is about is reopening schools. And until we have a safe plan for ourselves and for students and for teachers and for the community, we're going to be continually working on to uh, plan to reopen our schools in the best possible way. And we're in the process of doing that. So, I, you know, I think whenever that plan is approved and we can put it in place that board meetings as well as students will be able to have uh, uh, present meetings. But at this point in time, we haven't come to that determination. I'm Tim. back now for the reason I completely lost everybody. I'm back though. <laughs> okay, Tim. Also, I just want to make it clear that um, you know, the school district does not have the authority to close itself. That can only come from the Department of Health or from the governor's executive order. So we were mandated to come up with a plan to reopen school. And that is why we're having the conversation um, this evening about the reopening uh, of the plan. But we do not have the authority to close ourselves. That can only come from the Department of Health or from executive order from the governor's office. Uh, thank you, Eric. Very good point. Um, Julie, I know you've got some more. Yep, I have some more. Um, how come every time the question about a family who's uncomfortable with sending their child to school and wants 100% distance learning, is there not a straight answer given? Can you please address this issue? I'm very confused as I hear if you are uncomfortable sending your child to school that you must homeschool and Springs will not provide distance learning. Can you please clear this up for me? Currently, from the State Education Department, from the Department of Health, the directive is in-person learning, unless you cannot socially distance, that you don't have PPE equipment, or your hospital is at capacity. It was like the first slide that I looked at. So we're being directed to come back in person, unless. So that's where we're caught in one word, and yes, it does address vulnerable and at-risk students. It does not address parents who are uncomfortable sending their children back. I have asked the question to every person that can possibly give us an answer, including our attorney. But the Department of Health is who we are waiting to hear from for clarification if a school district must accommodate every parent who wants remote learning because they're uncomfortable. We will definitely accommodate children at risk and children who are vulnerable. And those definitions are outlined in the Department of Health guidance that are on our website. If you click on the PowerPoint presentation tonight, they're in there as well as the resources that are on our website. And I'd be happy to work with anybody where those criteria are for remote learning. Home instruction provided by the parent is an option. That was the original intent of state education was to extend the deadline. So parents who 
were uncomfortable about sending their children to school could fill out the application and home school their children. That option was given. Okay, Julie. Okay, from Jody Holman, she wants to just clarify that no air conditioning in classrooms with everybody wearing masks all day long, question mark. We will get guidance from the EnviroScience on how safe it is to use air conditioning units in lieu of keeping windows open. The unit vents are a heating mechanism that circulates the air. So we wouldn't want to turn those on when we could get fresh air from opening up windows. We want to turn on the unit vents when we want heat in our room and know that the air is being circulated from the outside in. Okay, the next one is Mike Sullivan. What is the plan for immunocompromised students and staff? That is one of the illnesses on the list. So those individuals need to let us know that their child um, is vulnerable and the district has to provide um, remote learning for that child. And for that staff member, they would file under the EEOC for accommodations. Now those accommodations could be um, teaching remote learning if we have a number of students that require it or it could be that they exercise um, their ability to use their sick time and ask for a leave of absence, um, should it be for an extended period of time. And in both those instances, does someone need to provide a doctor's note? Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, all right, Julie, next. Okay, the next one's from Saibdan Dolan. Do we Javon. have a phone? Yes, do we have a full roster of substitute teachers for the coming year? It's a good, a very good question. What we would like to do with our substitutes and we'll make this recommendation to the Board of Education is to hire about six permanent subs. These are individuals that are certified of course. And this way we limit the number of people in our building. We limit substitutes that would be teaching in other districts. Correct. We do have our ENL teachers and our um, AIS teachers pushing into rooms so they could be used too. Eric, did I miss anything? No, and, and the, the reason why we want to secure a number of subs, as Ms. Winter said, is because we would like our subs, since they'd be working four days a week, to work every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And by doing so, we can guarantee that they won't be working in another school district, um, which also helps us making sure that we're not bringing anybody who may be contaminated from the outside into our building. If we know that they're working predominantly or you know full time with us, then then we can secure that. Okay, next. Um, actually, that was my last uh, question that I have via email. But if I get anything past the board meeting, then I'll be happy to pass it on to sure. Ms. Winter for the Q and A, and I will send all of these emails to her also. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. And what we'll do, Julie, is we'll put we'll put together a Q and A that we'll post on our website for parents. Uh, we're going to ask that you just give us a day or so to go through all your questions and get the correct answers, and we'll have that hopefully posted. Um, today is Monday. Hopefully by Wednesday. All right. Uh, I will send. I'll send all the questions to administration. Uh, I had something to ask to Julie as well. Hello. Hello. I, I had um, sent a letter about special ed to Julie uh, earlier today. You're cutting out, Christy. I'm sorry. We could hear. We, it's, it's it's hard to hear. Christy saying that she sent the letter to Julie. Um, Hello. In, for the uh, special ed department. That's what she's. That's what she's saying. Julie, did you get the letter right. from? Oh, okay. Is that a letter that we were supposed to read? I'm not sure. I'm just oh, translating okay. what, what Christy said. Um, yeah. Yep, no, it, I do have a letter. I wasn't sure that it was for public commentary. I wasn't sure if it was just a letter that was sent to administration or the board. Right, I saw that. I thought that was just something you were sending to the board uh, because it, it was not, since it was not really a question, but is that something that you would like to read publicly? Yep. 
I can read it publicly if you'd yeah. like to. It's just the Deer Springs Administration and Board. Yes, so I, I assumed it was a you know a, a letter. I'm sorry, Chris. Would you like me to read that, Christy? She does. Okay. Huh. Please. Okay, Deer Springs School Administration and Board of Ed and Board of Education. Spring School has an extraordinary special education program that makes our school proud. We were even able to provide a live in-person summer program for our most vulnerable students. This program was severely modified to account for the very unique needs of these students. The program was developed by teachers directly involved with students. The front of the SYA building has been utilized for classroom instruction services, including speech, occupational therapy, and physical therapy. Students from three self-contained classrooms have been accommodated. We are quite literally your frontline workers, and we hope that you listen to our recommendations. During the three weeks of our summer school, we have had successes and failures. Based on our real life experience with these students, we have made the following recommendations. One, all three high need self-contained classes should contain to utilize, should continue to utilize the SYA building along with our speech and occupational therapist. A, this freezes up four classrooms in exchange for two in SYA. B, by making these classrooms a cohort, we are maximizing safety while still maintaining appropriate education. If the classes remained in the building in separate rooms, we would struggle to provide the students our previous high education, high level of education as co-teaching and shared resources were critical to our success. Children with behavioral and hygiene concerns can be best managed in the contained space of the SYA. Many members of the therapeutic crisis intervention team would be together where we can easily address and de-escalate behavioral issues. Physical therapy could be provided in the SYA where there is adequate space for stretching exercises which were previously provided in the now unavailable commons room. Two, students attend four of the five days with Wednesday as a day of online instruction. A, this allows for students to increase their online skills as we will likely not remain in person throughout the year. B, it, will also, it also provides a least restrictive environment for those who are required to spend time in general education as they can participate with their mainstream classes online on Wednesday. Three, Shortened school days are provided for several of our students who are currently unable to sustain full day instruction under the safety restrictions. A, as mentioned earlier, we have students with more serious behavioral and or hygiene needs. Some have struggled to make it through even 90 minutes of instruction during summer school. B, increasing the day, increasing the school day over time will enable these students to experience a successful transition back into a longer day as they become more comfortable with current restrictions. Thank you in advance for listening to and respecting the opinions of your frontline workers. Sincerely, Christy LaMonda, Patricia Philibar, and Whitley Reelinger. Christy will be available live for further questions. Very nice. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. We would definitely- Christy, um, Take we'll this. take a look at it. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I, I you know again is is age, the age groups together, so that might be a concern as far as putting you know kids from ages together. But this is something that we could definitely look at. Can you send that to us also? So I we, know that Christy, would you mind sending it to me? Yes, Mr. Of, myself? of course. Thank you. I will definitely send it to, to all of you as well. And as far as the age situation, uh, we were planning to make an accommodation to have two groups um, of dissimilar ages, both meeting in my classroom uh, had been the plan um, anyway. So we, we know that we are safe from a state point of view of being able to share that space as long as we have the separate teachers. So we, um, we appreciate you listening and, and we hope we can work something out that's great for everyone. Oh, thanks, Chrissy. I think that's interesting that you bring that up because something that I always liked about the way Springs handled special ed was how much you try to integrate special ed kids in with um, regular ed kids just in terms of being present around each other during the school day, being able to see each other and do things. So normally I would say, you know, 
it, it, this, I mean, obviously we're in such a different situation where there will not be any interaction in school. So that does sort of, um, you know, make, make sense in that respect to maybe change things for now. But um, I guess the administration will look at that along with, you know, whatever uh, room requirements are needed. But, uh, but thank you for, um, you know, reaching out about that. Thank you. Um, Julie, do you, are there any other questions at this time? No, I don't have anything. Okay. Um, so I know we have our next, uh, we have a work session on the third next week and then our next regular session on the 17th. So I'm guessing we'll be probably be reviewing some of these things on the third. I don't know what else we have on the agenda for that at this time. We can certainly think about that. But, um, you know, once this is posted, plus with whatever feedback you get, I guess we will um, adjust our fluid document. Um, That's but, what I recommend, Barbara. We come back on the third and, and continue talking about reopening. Yeah. Um, I do think we that we should talk about a Spanish um, presentation, and especially with all these questions that have been sent in, in addition to translating the presentation, can we get the questions that parents and teachers have asked this evening, those responses um, translated as well and, and put up? Absolutely. We can put it in English and Spanish. Okay. Um, if, if you would like you know, to have a special board meeting, Barbara, and you're willing to translate, uh, we, we could do that or we could just um, contact that parent mm -hmm. and run through the, the, the slides with her. Right. I mean, if there's only one parent, I'm happy, I'm happy to talk to them. I mean, I would ha be happy to speak to a larger group also. I don't know that it needs to be a whole board, meet, board meeting then, um, but, you know, it, yeah. it would be nice. My recommendation would be, what if we did a, um, a video with Elizabeth Mallins when she's working at the district, if she just read our presentation and then we posted it online or sent it to the parents? Um, we could do that. I mean, there is something nice about the interactive um, quality of a meeting like this, but, uh, you know, I, or you, is there a way we can um, get in touch with our Spanish speaking parents and ask them if they would be interested in having a live presentation or here's the information that we have and, you know, does that suffice and do they have other questions? Yeah, I can speak to Elizabeth and see if she'll yeah. reach out to the Spanish community and um, possibly do something that way. Okay. Between her and yeah. All right. Okay, board members, anybody have any other questions or comments at this point? All right, I think we're officially at the end of public commentary number two then. Uh, in that case, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion. Barbara, do you mind if I ask oh. a question real quick? Sorry. It's uh, Sean. It's no. Sean. Yeah, sure. I was I was under the impression that we were going to um, adopt a policy tonight. Are we going to be able to do that? Or are we putting that off? Adopt what policy? The the pol well, are we adopting a plan going forward? I thought we had to turn it in the thirty first. No, it's not actually being adopted. It's being posted Got to it. the state. So it's not like an official. It doesn't require an official board resolution. And as we've mentioned, that the document will certainly be fluid and open to change. It's not any kind of uh, official appointment that we're then, you know, married to and have to have complications with making any changes. All right, thanks. Okay. The um, link will actually be posted on our website. Um, no, the, the document will be posted on our website on Friday or by Friday. And then the link to the plan goes to the state with me certifying 28 pages of assurances. So the state knows that the document is going to be fluid. That's why they're not asking us to upload the plan, take it off, put it back up. They just want the website where they can find the plan. Right. Like, so for an example, you're going to put the plan up with AABB. If you decide after talking further or whatever that you think, oh, we want to do ABAB, you adjust the plan, but you don't have to go through some rigmarole in order to do so. so. Correct. Okay. Um, Okay, and so the, plans, I, the, the plans are considered approved by submission unless we get notified that there's something wrong with them. Right. Um, 
so actually, before we adjourn, I just want to say again, thank you to everybody who was involved with this process, to our administration and to all the committees. Uh, you know, we've just we've seen how hard everybody's been working on this, uh, a very complicated scenario all around and very easy to second guess what you're doing and and have all sorts of different thoughts. So thank you for um, putting this all together. And it uh, it's a plan requiring uh, patience and fluidity and um, but you know as we, together we make a difference right and we can um, we will get through this like we get through many things as long as everybody has patience and, and flexibility and hopefully our our parents understand that and also I'm sure I know they all appreciate um, how much effort everyone has put into this so uh, thank you all again um, it's a pleasure Barbara to work with everybody our community members you know, and our teachers and our staff who have just, you know, whenever we've asked for a meeting, they've been available for us. So. Correct. I just sent them another one. So we're having another meeting tomorrow at 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, keep in mind too, Barbara, this, I mean, folks came together really quick. We didn't receive guidance really until the 13th and the 15th of July. Yeah. And today, so, you know, not even two weeks later, we have a pretty comprehensive plan prepared to move forward. So again, it, that would not have happened if it wasn't for the teachers, community members, parents, you guys who you know allowed Enviro Science to work with us. Um, it really has been uh, a whirlwind, but it has been uh, great to work together with so many stakeholders. Yep. Well, Bob, uh, I'd like to just say, you know, I like I want to thank everybody too. This has been great, you know. And you said the big word was flexibility. We need this thing is an evolving thing. We have no idea what's going on. Every day it changes. So flexibility is the key word here that you used, you know, and I want to thank everybody that helped has worked on this. They really worked hard. Thank you. As a community you, member, as a, parent, as a parent, I really do. Thank you, Pat. Yeah. Um, so I know we'll be hearing from you uh, over the course of this week.